A few years ago, I'm 33 now, I came to the realization that I cannot intellectually claim any certitude about whether or not supernatural entities exist, but emotionally, I believe in something. It was a hard thing to come to terms with, actually. I think I had a bit of cognitive dissonance. Rationally, these things do not exist, but I still believe that they do, if that makes any sort of sense. My personal encounters with the ghosts are pretty mild. When I was very young, a door slammed in the basement in a room where my sister, cousin, best friend and I were playing. We paused, looked at each other with terror-stricken faces, then clambered over each other trying to run upstairs as fast as we could. We all remembered that encounter till this day. Another time, I walked downstairs and saw my deceased grandfather's old rocking chair rocking back and forth. Now, this thing was really, really heavy. And I mean like, it's a rocking chair built from industrial purposes. It had thick, heavy wood, and it was rocking bathing forth at a full swing. There was no one else in the basement, so I thought that perhaps the cat could be sleeping on it, jumped off, and was hiding somewhere. After all, she did sleep there on occasion. A few months later, I saw my cat jump off the thing. She was on the very edge of the seat, which I imagine would create the most leverage for rocking. It did not budge an inch. But, the story I really wanted to tell you happened to me one day to my friend's dad. Let's call him Vance. Vance is the quintessential outdoorsman. I would be hard-pressed to choose between him or Les Stroud if I ever got lost in the woods and got to choose someone to be lost with me. He is a special needs teacher. Suffice to say, one of the nicest human beings that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, and I have never known him to lie or even exaggerate. He told the story just like he told his funny stories. He laughed through the whole thing as if he couldn't believe it happened to him. Anyway, in his younger years, he and one of his friends took a job for the Canadian government, where they had to catalog an old ferry rack in the lake in British Columbia somewhere. Apparently, sometime in the late 1800s, I know, nice and vague, it had sunk and had a bunch of passengers on it that died or something along those lines. I would imagine it was sometime during the gold rush when ramshackle businesses popped out of nowhere. I cannot remember exactly, but I think he said it was Pigeon Lake, not the one in Alberta, but I could be wrong. I did some lazy research and have found that a lake called Pigeon Lake exists in British Columbia, and that's about all. No one seems to live on the lake today, from my satellite views of Google Earth anyway, but there is another lake near it that seems to be a camping spot. I have also failed to find any information regarding a wreck at that point in the time in that area. Anyway, Vance and his friend, who are both certified divers, are driven and boated to the middle of the lake. They were the only ones, as it was secluded and seems to be to this day. The water is a bit murky, but they have flashlights and an all right view of things. They dive down. It may have been so deep that they had to acclimate as not to get bends, but I probably just added that to myself over time. Either way, just as they got their first glimpse of the wreck, like something out of a horror film. A fucking dude swims out of the scariest fuck deaths, rips the breathing nozzle out of Vance's mouth, takes a breath and swims away. Both guys see this and feel this. Vance puts his breathing apparatus back in. Obviously, they look at each other and they're like, what the hell? And then, head for the surface. Initially, their minds went to semi-rational places and they thought someone had come out in another boat. So, they came up, all concerned for this guy who was diving to dangerous deaths. I do believe they actually went back down to catalog the rack without further incident, because Vant is hardcore like that. Anyway, that story always scared the bejesus out of me. This happened a couple years ago, and I still remember it clearly as if it really creeped me out. I grew up in a very strict home. My dad is a preacher, my mom is a workaholic. So, you can imagine what I went through in my teen years as I was a very rebellious. I was into gangs, drugs, and that sort of thing. I had just gotten out of a nine-month county jail stay and had six months in boot camp. 
so I was very excited to smoke some weed. However, I was still on probation, but I had heard about synthetic weed, and it was popular and easily available. This was music to my ears. Weed that can't be detected? Sign me up. Man, how I wish I had known the roller coaster it was going to cause my life. Anyway, so if you smoke synthetic weed, you know it fucks you up pretty bad. My parents started catching on, and soon I had to hide to get high. This was easy, because there is a very deep forest behind my house. I would jump the fence and walk until I found a place to sit down and smoke. After about two months of this routine, I was walking the trail that takes me to my favorite spot, when suddenly, I heard something from behind me. As I turn around, I notice that there is a man, a couple of yards away, walking in the same direction as me. I looked to him, and tried not to show any sign that had been startled by his sudden appearance. This man was tall and looked pretty worn out. He had crappy clothes and looked like he had come from a homeless shelter or something. There was something very creepy about how he walked. The stare he had was very disturbing. It felt like he was watching my every move. I could feel his fierce stare even while he was behind me. I turned to look at him and he didn't even blink. Just stared. I nodded in respect and kept walking. I had just finished boot camp, so I was ready to defend myself. I am also very paranoid. I couldn't stand the fact that this stranger was behind me, so I turned around to look at him. He asked, are you okay? In a mocking kind of tone, probably sensing my discomfort, I said, e yeah. Awkward. I noticed that even if I slowed down walking, he was making sure he stayed behind me. I even stepped off the side and pretended to text to watch him pass by, and he walked even slower in a very obvious way. He just kept staring with an evil look in his eye kind of like annoyed that I would even try to outsmart him. He was expecting me to run. He kept following me and staring at me. I probably should have turned around as much as, but I just was too scared and I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. What really bothered me was that he had his sleeves rolled up and was getting closer like he was playing to do something. I played a very desperate move. I stopped in my tracks and said very loud, did you hear that? I pulled out my butterfly knife and started into the woods to our side. He suddenly stopped and we both stood there in silence, just waiting there. I turned to face him, motioning him to be quiet. Acts like I heard an animal or something. I shrugged it off and said, Ha, huh, probably a pig or something. I kept the knife open in my hand like that as I walked, because all of the stalling and walking in the pretty deep woods now, I couldn't afford to turn back now. I noticed he was keeping his distance, still staring at me with a very mean look. Then, he was gone. I was so creeped out that I walked with the knife and just kept checking behind me. Finally, I felt pretty safe. However, I was a bit too far into the woods that I knew if I smoked that synthetic weed, I'd have to have to go all the way back really high. At least, it was still daylight, because trust me, I smoked back there at night. I know, how stupid. Anyway, I decided to take the main trail that ejects you into the far end of the neighborhood. All the other trails end up who knows where. I knew about a clearing where I was going to smoke, then walk back to my house, through the neighborhood to play safe. As I approached the clearing, my stomach dropped. One of the trunks was the man sitting there. What the fuck? How did he beat me here? But the thing that really bothered me was that he had something like a pickaxe or an axe. He was just sitting there. I watched him to see if he was chopping a tree or something. Nope, just talking to himself, rocking back and forth like a crazy person. I watched him trying to figure him out. He hadn't seen me, so I was very quiet. My knife was no match for that weapon that he had. I'd have to fight him. As all this was going through my head, he got up, grabbed an axe and walked in my direction. I don't think he heard me. I just think it was bad timing. Fuck this shit. I took off running, and not once did I look back. Once I left the trail and went to the woods to jump my house, I ran through those woods cutting and scraping my arms and face on the way and just not caring. 
That incident spooked me so much that I did not go back until about three months later. This story happened when I was about nine. I was hiking down a trail with my family. It was my mother, father, my older brothers Bobrov and Roman and our dog Charger. We were heading down a mountain after a day of hiking in a nice Siberian summer. I want to say it was mid-July, so it was actually fairly nice out. A fun little break from eight months of winter in the following mud season. We were walking down, and the sun was setting quickly that day, so we were about two miles from the bottom before it got dark. And so, we started hearing traditional nightlife start to pop up, such as owls and the like. Nothing too unusual. What struck me as odd, though, was my mother was an old-school Slavic pagan Manzi tribal member. So, she was really into the supernatural scene and she started getting freaked out. She kept saying something was behind us, and then she just kept saying Almas or Almasti, which means wow people. And my dad was a soldier in the Spetnaz. He fought in Sheshina, so he was very aware and always kept a gun on him. Initially, he just brushed it off as my mom got scared of the dark. So he held her hand and kept her close, trying to quiet her so she wouldn't worry us. Then, after 20 minutes more, my father just stopped and we all instinctively stopped as well. My father turned to the left, looking up a slight slope and said, We are being watched. Get behind me now. So naturally, my brother Roman and I get behind him with my mother and Bobrov stand beside my father. He was 15 and the oldest and bravest. My father hands him a small pistol. I think it was a Makarov, and pulls out the sidearm that he carried. Our dog, Charger, became strange and started smelling like crazy. And then, I noticed a very powerful smell. Almost like a wet garbage or dumpster juice. Just very foul when offensive to the senses. It almost made my eyes want to water. Charger then begins to bark and runs out of sight, up the slope towards the sinky source. My father, in an unusually cold but commanding manner, demanded, Charger, back now. Charger comes out of the bush and looks at us before taking another step forward. Then we see her get pulled back into the bush. She never yelped or cried, just as she was just gone in a blank. My, my father, at this point, cycled his pistol and held it up ready to fire and commanded, we move as a group down the hill now. So we did, and my father, covering up our backs for the whole rest of the way down. We got down safely. I really wish the story ended here. But whatever it was, followed us home. About two nights pass and we are sleeping in our small house. It was essentially a kitchen attached to one big bedroom like a small old-fashioned log cabin. We were located at the far end of our village, about 500 yards from the nearest house, so a little bit isolated, but not extremely. There were woods all around our house as well. I slept beneath the very small turning window. It was a window that was on a rotating stick in the center, and you could just kind of get a fresh breeze in, but it wasn't very large and it was about two feet above my head. I was sleeping next to my little sister, and then it was Roman, Bobrov, and then my parents, all in the same room but separate cots. It was crowded, but I liked having them so close. Turns out, that may be what saved me. It was early in the morning, two or three, and I swear in my sleep, I heard a small creak similar to the one this window made when you opened it. I friggin hated that the window, it always annoyed me. I heard the small creak and I felt something almost gently tug on my hair, on the front bangs on my face. I had kind of a mullet when I was younger. I began to wake up and sat up slightly, thinking Praz Bobrov was screwing with me, like he typically would in the early morning. Before I could think of anything else, I felt a large, violent, and very strong big hand grab my whole face. Two digits were beneath my jaw, so I couldn't even open my mouth to scream. This hand was so large I couldn't see anything in front of me, only my peripheral vision. 
This strong hand pulled me from my bed and towards the windows, as it was trying to drag me outside. I crowed a loud muffled scream as I kicked violently and tried hitting this thing in the arm. Whatever was holding me, my brother Bobrov held to me by the wrist, and my brother Roman held me by my legs as my sister screamed. I could hear my mother being frantic as my father raced out of the house. I could barely breathe, and the foul odor of this monster was filling my lungs. I think I could hear it grunting, but it was hard to tell between the frantic yelling and screaming. Finally, two gunshots break the commotion, the hand draws me to the floor, and I immediately get surrounded by my family when we hear it. The loudest deep roar of pain and anger that terrifies me to this day. It was long and loud and seemed to almost shake the very house. My father gave chase to this beast before he escaped into the woods. My father told us he had hit this creature twice but it still ran faster than he could have predicted and covered such a distance in a short span of time that it was difficult to hit it in the darkness. He later described it in detail to me. He said it was very broad in the shoulders and walked like a man, but had much more to weight to its steps. He described his face as very flat and heavily defined with a brow ridge and large eyes for nocturnal predators, almost like an owl and thick brown, very coarse hair that covered his whole body, except for the face, kneecaps, and hands. It seemed to stand roughly about seven and a half feet tall and had about 400 pounds of defined muscle to it. My father was a soldier and he had served four active combat tours. He was six foot eight, and this was the only time I remember seeing him in fear. This changed my father profoundly. He became a little less sure of himself and began hanging out with his old army buddies a lot more. My parents were divorced and my dad just moved into his new house a few months prior. He moved into the Rockies from the plains of Colorado so he could be closer to work. You see, before this, he had to take a two-hour drive every day up the mountains to get to work, where he would have 11-hour shifts, and then drive back. He was a cop and had just gotten back to work after eight months from his second major back injury. He ended up suing workers' comp and got a decent sum of money from that. So after a few months, when Christmas rolled around, he got me my brother AR-15s. I know what you're thinking, but we have gone up around guns and wouldn't think twice about seeing guns laying around the house. We enjoyed Christmas Day, and when nighttime rolled around, we went to our rooms and had the guns in our rooms as we slept. Now, before I tell you this next part, you must know that there are a lot of nut jobs out where I live in the mountains here. Also, my room has two windows, one to the left of me and one to the head of my bed. Anyways, I woke in the middle of the night, mind you that I am in a deep sleep, and it is almost impossible to wake me up without shaking me. Immediately, something felt off, so I just stayed still and tried listening to what was going on while pretending I was asleep. I was facing the window to the left of me, where I could see the forest out my window, and then I heard it, the lightest tap on the window I was facing. If I wasn't listening, I wouldn't have heard it. I couldn't see anything that could be making that sound, so I just watched and listened. About a minute later, I heard the tap again, followed by crunching of compact snow. Then I saw it. Behind the tree about 20 feet from my window, I saw two glowing eyes peer out. About 30 seconds later, I saw the arm of someone break off a branch and throw it at my window. Not wanting the person to know I was awake, I slowly slid off the other end of my bed and grabbed my AR-15. I loaded a magazine into it. My adrenaline was pumping because the nearest house was at least a quarter mile away and we were deep in the woods. Not wanting the intruder to know I was awake, I didn't charge the charging handle because of how loud it was. I put my phone in my shirt and texted my dad that someone is to the east of the house and immediately after that, I heard the sliding glass door open above me. I saw my dad's flashlight on his AR-15 light up the area. The guy ran and I could see he was wearing nothing but underwear and boots. My dad gave chase 
but after going a mile into the woods and searching for about an hour barefoot and in shorts in the snowy woods of the Rockies, he gave up. After he texted someone on duty at the time and searching the surrounding woods, all they found was a shirt and a candle on a tree branch. So this story happened to my best friend, who for safety's sake, I plan to call A for now. A and her boyfriend were sitting outside in a truck with another friend. While they were high, none of us had ever seen anything like this before. A saw something moving around outside of the truck and went to brush it off until one of the others asked if we had all seen it as well. According to them, it looked like a dog but had red eyes and the head of a jackal and seemed to be on its legs. And to back two legs, that was. It was moving too fast for a normal dog and was moving faster than its legs, it seemed. It disappeared for a moment before reappearing on the porch of the friend they were waiting on, K, and it appeared to be eating something. A called K and told her they were leaving, to which K replied, That was any of you guys in the house? A then said, she looked at towards the porch and saw her door was wide open. I've been to Kay's house before and it's not easy to get that door open, so they aren't sure how it happened. Even I got a bad feeling about hearing this. After I got a call late from A asking if I knew anything about demons, since we were both Wiccans. A went back to Kay's house the next day and said that things looked normal, but she could tell things just felt super off. My father used to enjoy going to this campground, not far from the hometown he grew up in. The campground was in Cavendish, Vermont. It was called Catton Place. He enjoyed how peaceful remote the area was, having been there a few times and observing that it was family friendly. He thought it would be nice to bring his daughter with him. Choosing to go the same time of year that he went the last few times, he saw familiar faces. There was this campsite of three men who were out of staters in their 40s. Most likely, they were from Boston because of their accent. They had a big fancy trailer and the entire site was decked out with a dartboard, hammock, lawn chairs, garden gnomes, and patches of fake grass. From observation, it looks like they stayed there a couple of weeks at a time. All settled in and quite comfortable. Too comfortable, actually. To the point that they walked around with a sense of superiority, boastful and loud. They acted like they owned the place. The place was actually run by an elderly couple. These macho acting goons were quite friendly with them. The year before, they painted the playground for them for free, so the elderly couple loved these guys. My father saw these men around last time, but didn't have to deal with them or worry much because their camp was situated far apart from them. This time, unfortunately, we were placed quite close to them with only one empty campsite separating us. We were surrounded by other campsites too, but about 30 feet away, there was a middle-aged couple camping out as well. Here is when the story starts. We arrived and set up our camp. I remember observing those men across from us. My father waved a friendly hello to them and they waved back. Throughout the day, I played on the playground. By nighttime, we roasted hot dogs and marshmallows. Meanwhile, those macho goons across the way were partying hard, booze everywhere and blaring tunes on the radio, lots of laughs and bickering too. We didn't pay much attention or look over that way, we just kept to ourselves. Tired yawns, we crawled into our tents and tried to go to sleep, but all the ruckus was still going on. I was able to fall asleep but my father was not. He lay there for a few hours and kept checking the time occasionally. It was getting closer to midnight, and he wondered if the middle-aged couple nearby were having trouble sleeping over this noise too. Then, the sound could be heard of a vehicle coming down the road. It was the elderly man who owns the place. He stops and lets the men know there's been a noise complaint. The men apologize profusely and say they'll be settling into their sleep soon. The owner leaves. They immediately start cussing and throwing things around their campsite as the owner was out of sight. They were offended that somebody had reported them. 
Who do you think did it? One of the others asked. Well, it's you the guy and the little girl next to us or the couple over there? The other guy responds. Third guy adds, I didn't see any of them leave in their car to go to the front desk. So one of these people must have a cell phone. This was 1997 or 1998. So cell phones weren't as common back then. These men began conspiring to figure out who owned the cell phone. They weren't trying hard to speak in a hushed tone because my father could hear everything. I bet it's the asshole the Cadillac who owns the cell phone. I'm going over there, one of them says. They're talking about my father. He does not have a cell phone though. The feeling of pure fear came over him. He has no idea what's going to happen and needs to think fast. The sound of stumbling footsteps come right up just inches away from our tent. What to do? What to do? My dad thought of making a noise, any noise, and he grabbed the soda can next to him, flicked the top with his fingers, and this guy started and takes a step backwards. He then scurries away back to his drunk buddies. They are now whispering amongst themselves. He can't pick up on what they're saying, but catches the part where they're saying that they're going to try again later. He wonders if he heard that right. What the hell are these guys trying to do? There's no way my father is going to try to fall asleep now. In fact, he's not feeling tired at all. Hopped up on so much adrenaline right now from the fear. Man, with his daughter, feeling helpless. Only a soda can and a flashlight to protect us. My dad lays there frozen, listening, listening, listening. Hoping these guys would just give it up and just sleep off their drunk craziness. A short time passes and they hear the footsteps again. Their campfire is so bright that it casts a shadow into our tent. He can literally see the shadow of the man coming towards us. The man doesn't get as close as this time because, again, he stops at the noise coming from our tent. My dad had unzipped his sleeping bag in a panic, ready to defend and protect us, just in case the man was going to try to come in our tent. The man is not moving anymore. He's just standing there watching us. My dad remembered he had a lighter in his pocket, so he took it out and from underneath the blanket flicked the switch on. He was just hoping it would mimic the sound of a gun getting ready. I don't think it worked. But the man eventually did turn around and go back to his campsite. You won't believe this. They're still awake. What the fuck? They all sputtered against themselves. Maybe just maybe being around 2.30 a.m. now, they will finally go to sleep. Nope. At this point, I'm still sleeping. But I'm tossing and turning a lot. My feet slap against the side of the tent, and a couple of times, and the footsteps are approaching us again. While I brush my feet against the side of the tent, Ugh, the man says, with an exasperated sigh. He starts to walk away, but not to his campsite. He walks towards the road, walks a few feet, stops, and screams at the top of his lung, If I find out who reported us, I will kill you. You hear me? I will fucking kill you. Everything is still now. Only sounds I could be heard is the crackling of the campfire and the occasional indistinct chatter amongst the men. Then, finally, the sound of their trailer door shutting at 5 a.m. They're asleep. My dad lays there trying to process everything that has happened. By 6 a.m., he wakes me up to pack up and get out of there. This happened in the Appalachian Mountains of northeastern Pennsylvania, about a year ago from now. I was camping with some friends at a private campground. We were going to enjoy the weekend at the campsite, and when I got there, I decided to pinch my tent. My friends were kind of loud at night, so I chose to set up my tent across the campsite, near a small pond. The area I had my tent in was a small bit of land that had the pond on my left and a creek on my right so it was almost like a land bridge between the two bodies of water. When it had gotten to the time for me to go to sleep for the night, I walked to my tent and went to sleep. My tent was by itself across the campsite, because I like my privacy. I went to bed, and boy, I was awoken later in the night. I wasn't sure what time it was when I woke up, but it was still dark out. If I were to guess, I'd say it was around 4 in the morning or so. I put my head back down to go back to sleep, but I was beginning to hear some loud footsteps approaching from the direction of the creek. 
I listened to them get louder as whatever it was got closer. It wasn't an animal on four legs, like a bear or a deer, because the footsteps were inceptive too. The footsteps were eventually right near my tent and then they stopped. Then, I heard a star sniffing the air around me for what felt like hours. I was terrified because I had no clue what was right by my tent. I just stayed still through the hopes that it wouldn't hear me moving. I sat there hoping it would just walk away until it ran back to where it came from. After about an hour, I went to my friend's tents to find them all asleep. It couldn't have been one of my friends because whatever it was ran in the opposite direction of the tents, and I would have heard it walk towards my friend's tents. In the morning, I found the grass near my tent padded down, as if something heavy had been standing there for a while. I never experienced anything like that since, and I still don't know what it could have been. I'm a 17-year-old male who lives in a small town in the middle of a forested area. But the story I'm about to share has haunted me, my friend, for many years. And since the following is going to be a few different events, I'm going to tell them in the order that they happened over a time span of four months. I'm an exploring kind of person. I love horror and rush of adrenaline. I believe in the paranormal and I have a close friend who does the same. We spend a lot of time together, out walking on old railroad tracks and talking about life, just winding down. We're really close and I see him as my brother. Considering how we've known each other our entire lives, Let's just call him W, just to simplify things. There's this old hospital that lies on the outskirts of town, just by the woods. It's been shut down for probably 60 plus years now, and has been pretty much abandoned. Me and W usually cross the place when we're on our walks and often end up just talking about it and all the rumor it has, since supposedly people have died there in both before and after it shut down, and it's rumored that it was a mental asylum as well so it's a pretty creepy area. For the following to make sense, I'm going to explain how the place is laid out. Picture a lower capital N. The top part is where the entrance is. The back is where the three wings are, leaving two gaps between the wings. It was a late summer night, and the sun had just started to set. Our summer break was almost over, and the night had started to get a lot more darker this time around. We were circling this place, which wasn't as easy as you think. There's a lot of scrap and old tires and a lot of other stuff laying around. And since this place was unkept, we were walking around in waist-high grass. We were just joking around, trying to scare ourselves by sharing thoughts about how someone was probably living in there, staring at us. But that fantasy surely got more intriguing when we started to knock on a door we found just because we could. As we both went silent, we heard a knock come from inside. This got us quite interested, as we aren't easily scared. We stuck around, knocking on different locations, and at times, heard knocks back, usually in the set of three, in a rapid succession. That was what got us hooked in the first place, so we kept coming back, and finally, decided to try to find a way inside. One night, we found an old porch that was on the back of this place, between two of the wings that had been there and abandoned. We were having a hushed conversation as the activity of the place had picked up and trying to discuss how we were going to get up there and just decided that we were going to try to find this old fire ladder that was hanging about three meters off the ground. It was on the other wing. And as we were going up, we both heard something. The sounds of footsteps in the grass. Note that the two of us were standing in one of the corners inside the gap, so we had one way out, and that was towards the corner of the building. We both went quiet and both turned our head towards the corners that led out to the high and kept grass, and just as we did, the sound stopped. Whatever it was, you could hear that it was bipedal, and it was definitely trying to sneak up on us while we were talking, and it was just around the corner. We looked at each other, and W said following the exact words to me after barely a second of processing, said, Leggett, 
and we did. We ran to the opposite end of the opening, expecting to see something or someone following us when we came into the clearing. But we didn't. But that didn't stop us from running. But the one thing that stopped me was when W, who was right behind me, tripped and on an old tire and fell into the high grass. Luckily, he wasn't hurt, so after he got up, we took quick off again, and just before jogging the hell out of there, we looked back into the woods to see what seemed to be eyes glowing and looking back at us. We kept going there and following what happened a late afternoon during the fall as we had just planned that we were going to go in. Considering the ladder was unreachable from the ground, we were planning on our next visit. The ladder went up to the roof to the three-story tall building and went right past a window which was missing the frame and glass. So if you got up, you could easily just slip inside by stretching out your foot. We were standing at the bottom, looking up at the window, and since the building had a risk of having the floor collapse, we were going to th throw something up there through the window to see if we could hear it land in the floor. And since you'd be able to tell if it fell down one story, a following is a small detail which became horrifying to us later on. You could see the stairs just barely through the window from our ankle. I had just picked up a piece of wood and thrown it through the window. And sure enough, we heard it land on the floor. But, barely two seconds after the first thud, we also heard two thuds from the stairs, as if someone was walking down. As if something came to see what had made the noise. This creeped us out a bit, so we stuck around a while before starting to decide that we were going to leave for the day, when we heard something from out in the woods, which sounded like something drifting or burning rubber with a car. This was an impossible, considering how people recently started to get their driver's license and wanted to act tough in their old beat-up Volvos. W seemed to be a bit skeptical, and I did as well as that noise kept on going for at least 20 seconds flat. If it was something burning rubber, they wouldn't be doing it for that long. And it also stopped so abruptly, like it just cut off, before continuing for maybe about 5 or 10 more seconds. But that made me so sure it wasn't someone acting cool, was the fact that it started sounding more like human with time, like a girl just screaming. But for that long and that loud? We got way too unnerved to stick around when we started hearing the rustling in the woods, so we left for that day, and the following is the last visit we ever made to that place. It was a rainy autumn night. It was quite dark and we were heading out there again. We were decently prepared with flashlights, a rope, and gloves to give us a better grip and fully charged phones. The plan was to use the thick rope he had brought, which had a small loop on the end to get around one of the bottom steps of the ladder, and then pull the rope through the loop so we could climb up and reach the ladder. It took us about 15 minutes to get the rope up and around, and also down and get the rope secured. This whole time, we were felt watched and unnerved, like something didn't want us there. We felt trapped like something was going to come running at us from behind, our only exit. The cold rain made the climb up hard, as we were getting a rigid, and the rope was slippery, but I got up, and the moment I did, I felt isolated for some reason. The climb to the window was probably a few meters, which meant that if I fell, I could seriously injure myself, on either all the broken glass or the old scrap. But what terrified me the most was the moment I stepped inside. It was pitch black, and this overwhelming weight came over me, and I felt weak in my entire body. Shining the flashlight along, I saw old needles, dark brownish spots in the floor and walls, a bloody rag, and rusty old stairs. Also, there were two long hallways on both to the left and right that seemed to go on forever. Something my mom was convincing me not to turn around and look down the hall. Because if I did, I could tell. It was not out of fear that I would see something terrible. I did my best to try to get W up to climb up and join me, but he refused, and I don't blame him. I didn't stay in there very long. I soon climbed down and we left, leaving the rope. I felt dread stuck in me with fur. It just felt like days, 
I couldn't stop fuming this, this creepy feeling. It's never left me, and that I always feel like something is following me. This was last year and it still haunts us. I started wanting to go back there, to go back inside but Dubby refuses to go back to that place again. Doing some reachers, I came to the conclusion of it being a demon that has latched on to me, as they apparently want to get to their victims, back to the place that they latched on to get stronger. I've also went back there during the daylight a few times, and I, I tried to collect the rope, but it was clean cut right where the loop was, leaving a small knot. I remembered that it was roughly three to four meters up in the air, and the cut was pretty much a perfect one. We still talk about this, and sometimes see lights in the window that old place when we pass at night. So this all happened when I was about 12. I was, and still am currently living in the suburbs of Alaska. Around where I lived, there wasn't many people. So if you were to scream, it's unlikely anyone would ever hear you. I was in a ditch that was near my neighborhood. I had just gotten home and my older brother wasn't due to get home until an hour later. When I was in the ditch, I was playing, when my attention came to a pair of large footprints. Like any other curious 12-year-old would do, they led me deeper into the ditch, where there was a large curve that separated from civilization. After a while, I saw moose prints. I followed those for a bit, but then I saw fresh wolf or dog prints. I know they were fresh because the prints were still a bit wet. I looked forwards and into the woods a bit. After a moment, I saw two figures move quickly. At first, I thought it was two rabbits, until I remembered the dog prints and realized the two figures were too big to be rabbits. A bit unsettled, but still curiosity filled me, I climbed out of the ditch so I could get a better view. I was looking intently into the woods when I saw something moving in my direction. This made me step a few feet back, instantly regretting it because of what I had learned in school of what to do if an animal approached me and the fact that I couldn't see the animal anymore. At this point, I was slowly taking steps backwards so I could get closer to my home when something caught my eye. I saw another dog to my left. At this point, I said screw it and turned around and walked faster towards home. It took a while and I couldn't exactly run as the snow went up to my knees and it was also at the stage of starting to mount, but being incredibly damp and heavy. After about 10 minutes of walking, I made a home in one piece. I considered myself lucky that the wolves didn't attack me because if they did, I would have been dead meat before anyone realized I was even gone.